pray this song blesses you today. It's taken straight from scripture. It's taken from Numbers 6, 24 through 26. Welcome to Liberty Ministries. We're glad you're here with us today. This morning we're going to be talking about the fall. Um, a lot of times we focus on the fall of man and that we've fallen from grace, and that's all true. Uh, but there was more going on during that time. And so this morning we're going to look at that today. Adam and Eve had, or Adam had been created. He's walking in the garden. God brings all the animals to him, and he names them. And whatever name he gives them, that's what they would be. Uh, and he didn't use names like Bill and Joe and John and Susie and Louie. He named them from a part of their body or from their behavior. So it was a characteristic to them and to them alone. Now, he did this throughout all the animals. And God seen that Adam was alone, and so he had a deep sleep fall upon him. And we find him in this passage in Genesis chapter 2, verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into, wom into a woman. And he brought her to man. And Adam said, This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken from man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined 
to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they shall, and they were brought both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, and we thank you for your love, and we thank you for your mercy. Lord, we ask you to anoint me as I speak your word, and Father, anoint the congregation as they hear your word. Lord, that your spirit opens us up and shows us the enlightenment that comes from you and from you alone. And Father, we ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this is the first union, a marriage. God created man. He created woman. Out of all the creatures, God created man and blew, blew breath into him, making him unique. And then when he created his helpmate, he didn't form her from the dirt. He took her from his side, his rib. One man said that he took her from the bone from the side, not to rule over him from the head or not to be from a bone from his foot, to be under him, but to be his companion beside him. It's also unique that I've read where they have said that the rib is one of the few bones that if it's taken out, it will actually grow back. So we see that Adam has now fallen asleep. God, take a rib out, makes woman. He brings them back and Adam names her just as he named the animals. Because she was part of me, therefore she will be called woman because she's part of man. And that they are one flesh and one bone. A marriage, when people come to get married, they are standing before a congregation and they pledge their love to each other and they make their vows to each other. And we forget so often the commitment that we're actually making. Because that marriage vow, we say until death do us part, is that one woman and that one man being bonded together in that holy union. Now, why is that so important? Because that union was established by God. It was something that God was sharing of himself. As Jesus, the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are united as one, he says, I want you, husband and wife, to be united as one. I want you to have that fellowship, that union with each other so that you understand each other and you work together and you flow together. That was the first marriage. Now I want you to understand this because this is very important. Because we were created in God's image, the devil hates us. He hates God, he hates everything about God. And every time he looks at you and I, he sees God and he just despises us even more. And then when we get married, he despises that even more because that's the union that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have, that union to work together as one. And God says, now I bestow it upon man that they can have it as well. And the devil hates that even more. So when you look at John chapter 10, verse 10, he says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And I want you to understand because the devil has come only to steal, kill, or destroy. He wants to steal or kill the marriage or the union. He wants to destroy it any way he can because anything he can do to break it up makes him happy because it separates us from God. It breaks down the plan that God had for us. Now we make plans for our kids. And when things happen and it doesn't go the way we want it to, we don't get mad at the kid. We're sorry that they have to go through it. We try to help them through it. But at the same time, sometimes they have to go through it because of their own stubbornness. Well, it is the same way with us. So that Jesus says, I want you to understand this is the devil's game plan. I'm going to kill, steal, or destroy your relationship. Whether it be in marriage or other relationships or a relationship with God. That's the devil's plan is to try to steal it. But Jesus says, I've come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly, not just in heaven, but here. He wants us to have an abundant life here, to have that union, to have that peace, to have that joy, to have that overflowing happiness within our life. So pastor, I don't feel very happy at all. 
fact, I feel pretty sad at times. Well, that's part of life too, because if you didn't feel the sadness, you wouldn't know what happiness is. But he says, overall, I want you to have that peace and that joy, that abundant life, to understand that God is working through you and in you at all times. See, God established this in Genesis, and he says it's still being fulfilled all the way through now. When Jesus came, he reiterated it and said, this is the plan that God has set for you, and I want you to understand this. I want you to have that abundant life. And a lot of times we think abundance, we think of a lot of stuff, lots of money. The Bible makes it very clear. The more money you have, the more problems you have. Proverbs. So if you want more problems, you want more money. Me, we always think, well, if I had more money, I'd have less problems. No, it's just the opposite. That's why God says, I want you to have an abundant life. It doesn't mean I'm going to be poor. I'm going to have enough to have what I need. I'll be able to live the way he wants me to live. But I will have peace in my heart. I will have joy in my soul to know that everything is going to be okay no matter what takes place. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 2, he says, And the woman said to the serpent, You may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, I want you to understand what God really said. In Genesis chapter 2, verse about 16, he tells Adam, he says, Adam, you can eat of any of the trees here in the garden, except this one here in the middle, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Do not eat of this tree, for if you do, you will surely die. Now, when you listen to the words that Eve spoke, you know exactly where that comes from. That didn't come from God. God did not tell Eve not to eat of that tree. Adam did. So, well, how do we know that? Because God told Adam, Adam was responsible for telling Eve. And if you listen to the words that Eve reiterates, I was told that we shall not eat of this tree. Don't even touch it. Doesn't that sound just like a man? Don't eat of this tree. Don't even go by it. Don't even touch it. Just leave it alone or you're surely going to die. Whenever we add to God's word, we give the devil a loophole to defeat us. That's why Jesus says don't add to or do not take away. Read it for what it is. And Eve then adds to it because that's what she was told. Don't even touch it. And the serpent, being as cunning as he was, said, look, I'm touching it. Look how, this is it gorgeous. It's good to eat. It's wonderful. Look. Oh, but you'll surely die. Now, I want you to understand this because too many times we forget. When you say surely die, you immediately think, you bite it, you drop over dead. Because that's what God said, you'll surely die. He didn't say you're going to die immediately. He said, surely you will die. The devil's using the same plan today that he used then. He tells you, oh, don't worry about smoking. It's not going to kill you. And we know for a fact that it does kill you. It just takes time. Drugs, alcohol, all kinds of things. Sin always takes its time to kill you. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen instantly. Can you imagine if the first time you took a, a puff of something, you dropped over dead? Nobody would take a puff. Oh, no, he just died. I ain't doing that. You know, you can take a frog, put him in a pan, put him in cool water, and turn the stove on. And that frog will sit there, and as that heat gets rising, he'll sit there and sit there and sit there until he dies. You can cook him to death. But you take a frog and drop him in that hot water, he's going to jump right out. Why? He knows that's not good. But because he's set in it from the beginning, it, he uh, assimilates with it. So that as it gets hotter, he gets hotter. 
And he just stays right in. Oh, this is normal. That's how sin is. The devil knows if he jumps right in and throws the sin at us, we're going to stand up and say, oh, I resist you. You're not going to make me sin. But if he just comes along and says, hey, just, just try a little bit of it. Just a little bit more. Oh, see, it, it's not hurting you. You're fine. Just try a little bit more. Oh, see, you can just keep doing it. This doesn't bother you a bit. And he walks with you and keeps you talking while he's keeping it worse. And if he can keep you working that direction and take away your alertness of sin, he will slowly lead you into the path of destruction. That's why God said, you will surely die. The, whoop, the ser ser serpent tells the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Remember I told you the devil's plan is to steal, kill, and destroy? Here it is right now. The same principle that he uses then, he uses on you today. The first thing he says is he tells you a lie. And then he fills it with truth. Just enough to make it believable. Surely you won't die. Come on now. God knows that. He knows that you're going to be like him. You're going to know the difference between good and evil. That wasn't the problem. The problem was the disobedience. It wasn't about them knowing the difference between good and evil. It was about them losing their innocence. The devil is always trying to steal the innocent, whether it be of children or of adults. When you make that first commitment to your spouse and you've committed to that person and you fall in love with that person and you're doing all the things and you're working hard and your relationship is growing and then all of a sudden the devil comes along 20, 30 years down the road. Hey, look at me. That looks pretty good. Solomon writes, when she calls to you, run. Do not hang around with her. She will seduce you. Run. And what happens? The devil begins to work on the relationship to bring it to destruction. It's just a little tease here, a little tease there, and sucks you in taking away the innocent of the relationship, taking away the innocent of a child because all of a sudden they're thrown into that which is overwhelming to them. He always takes the truth and stuffs it full of lies because then it's, as one man says, a little bit of sugar makes the medicine go down. That's all it is. The devil's sing a little bit of sugar with it so you'll swallow the lie. Having the knowledge does not make you like God because now they have the knowledge. And what was the first thing they did? This is a husband and wife. For the first time, they looked at each other and go, you're naked. I'm naked. And the Bible says, and their shame that came with it. What changed? Were they not naked before? Yes, they were naked before, but it didn't bother them. Why? Because they were innocent of it. Their relationship was innocent. They had no worries about it. Why? Because it's just the way they were. But now they had the knowledge of good and evil. Now they understand what nakedness is. When you see a child... Young child, mom's trying to change the diaper, and he jumps up and darts across the room. Woo, I'm free! And he runs out the house and runs in the front yard. Look at that naked kid. As adults, we go, yeah. he doesn't know any better. He doesn't know what it's about. Or she doesn't know what it's about. They're innocent. In time, they will understand. 
in time, they understood. And they realized for the first time that they were naked. In fact, they were naked and they were ashamed and they went and sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. To cover their nakedness. We hear God coming to them in the cool of the day like he always did. Adam? Adam? Adam didn't respond. Adam, where are you? I'm over here, Lord. What are you doing over there? I'm hiding. Why are you hiding? Because I'm naked. Who told you you were naked? No answer. Did you eat of the tree that I told you not to? See, God already knew what was going on. It wasn't no surprise to him. When we see our kids do things, we know what they've already done. A little boy, always his mom would say, Johnny, what are you doing? I'm not drowning the cat in the toilet. He would always speak out what he was doing. I'm not trying to shove things in the wall plug. I'm not painting on the wall. She'd just say, Johnny, what are you doing? He'd tell what he was doing. I'm not, but he is. So God says, what are you doing? Why, who told you you were naked? And he's thinking, uh, what do I say? Uh, um, it was the woman you gave me. In other words, he says, I'm doing good, but because you gave me that woman and you gave her to me, that's what the problem is. And he says, woman? And immediately she says, well, if it worked for him, it was the serpent. He beguiled me. And he turns to the serpent. Serpent? Did you do this? Yes, it's the Lord. And God says, because of what you have done, you have yielded yourself to the evil one. You will be cursed among all creatures. You will crawl up on the, your belly and eat the dust of all creatures. And immediately his arms and legs fell off. And he fell to the ground. And the Lord says, and from this point on, between her seed and your seed, there will be enmity. In other words, her seed's always going to try to kill you. It's always going to be there. That's why snakes run from us. That's why when you see a snake, you want to kill it. That's why when you see it, ah, you jump, you scream, you want to step on it. You want to get away from it. It's a natural reflection. Why? Because that's the way God put it. That was his curse. Then he turns to the woman and says, Woman, because of what you've done, you're going to bear children and it's going to be painful because of this sin. Not only that, you're going to want your husband You're going to desire him to be over you. And ladies, you know, that can sometimes be a struggle. Then he turns to Adam. He says, Adam, because you ate, because you allowed this to take place, where before you could go to the tree and say, I'd like fruit, and there would be a fruit on the tree. The ground would moisten from the bottom and water everything. In fact, more you study the scriptures, Adam probably had the speed of thought. He could move like Jesus did. We find Jesus in the Mediterranean in the New Testament, walking on water to the boat. Steps in the boat with the disciples, and when he stepped out of the boat, they was on dry ground. Seven miles they traveled in a moment. Adam probably had the same power. Adam could probably walk on water because he went out on the water and he named all the animals. All the things that Jesus did, Adam probably did. It was part of the DNA that we had before the fall of man. If somebody got hurt, he could probably just say, be healed. And they would be healed. All the things that Jesus did, he could have done more than likely because the Bible says that Jesus was the second Adam. Adam. But because of the fall of man, all that was taken away. So we see Adam here. And God says, because 
of your sin. You will now work by the sweat of your brow. And the ground will no longer give to you, but you're going to have to till it. And he cursed the earth with thorns and thickets and said, when you go to work, they're going to crop up. Weeds are going to get in your, your fields and going to make you work even harder because of your sin. Did they die right then? No. In fact, Adam lived to be 930 years old. And then he died. But surely he died. Because of their sin, it never happens instantly. It's always down the road. Your sin today, you may not pay for it today, but you're going to pay for it down the road. First Peter tells us, very simply, all men receive their punishment, some before judgment, some after. But all men receive it. They well, I'm going to go get saved and then I won't have to pay for anything. Oh, yeah, you're still going to reap it because you planted wickedness, you're going to reap wickedness. So you've got to start tilling that up and planting goodness so that you can reap goodness. And God says, I want you to understand this, Adam. Because of your sin, this is what's taking place. How many times have you ever felt like there is no hope? There's no way of getting out of this. All this mess that I'm in, I don't know how I got here, but here I am. God says, there's hope. It's in Jesus Christ. But you've got to go back and ask God to forgive you of your sins, to cleanse you of unrighteousness, to write your book in the Lamb of Life so that you can say, yes, I'm a child of God. And remember that when you do that, the devil's going to do everything he can to fight you. Get ready for it. Oh, but pastor, I, I, I can't take any more fighting. Don't worry. It's good fighting. When you have to fight the devil, you can stand up and say, in the name of Jesus, you're done. In the name of Jesus, you have to go. In the name of Jesus, you're, it's out of here. I can overcome all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Why? Because I have the power of Jesus Christ and the promise of Jesus Christ in me. So no longer am I bound by sin. No longer am I controlled by sin. I am set free. According to Paul, he, Paul says that we die out daily and God sets us free. We are no longer bound by sin, but we are free from sin. And when we understand those things, we can stand up for Jesus Christ and say, Lord, today I will serve you and I will serve you with all my heart. I do not want to lose my innocence. But when I do, Lord, forgive me and restore me. I do not want to struggle with the sin of life. Lord, set me free and restore me. Because God says, I have come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. God does not want you struggling day in and day out because you feel like you can't go where you need to go. Amen? God says, I want to set you free. I want to give you life. And I want to give it to you more abundantly. This morning, I ask you, are you tired of struggling? Are you tired of feeling overwhelmed, beat up, beat down? You feel like there's no hope in our government, in our society. You're still locked in. They're still saying no good, no hope. Just remember this. Jesus has come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. This very day, he wants to set you free. This very day, he wants to give you hope. This very day, he wants to give you joy. This very day, he wants to heal your body. This very day, he wants to set you free. But you have to say, yes, Lord. Forgive me of my sins and my trespasses that I may forgive others. And Lord, give me this abundant life that I'm not worried about what goes on in the world. You have got everything taken care of. In Revelations, it talks about the seven churches. And one of the churches, it says the, Philip, uh, the uh, church of Philadelphia. They were the brotherly love church. And God says, I know what you have gone through. And you were very weak. But you've been faithful. And because of that, I will save you from the tribulation, the trial time. God says, I'm going to give you abundant life. I'm going to get you out of the trials that you face. I'm going to walk you through them. 
You may have to still go through them, but I'm going to walk you through them so that you build up strength and that you can say, yes, my God set me free. Yes, my God delivered me. Because how will we know who God is if we haven't seen him in our life? So this morning I ask you to pray with me. Bow your heads. Jesus, I ask you, Lord, I want abundant life. I don't want it today. I want you to give me abundant life today, Lord. Heal my heart, heal my mind, heal my body. Set my soul free, Lord, that I may have joy, full of joy, full of peace, full of love. Lord, Father, forgive me for anything that I've done to others. And Lord, I forgive them for what they've done to me. Lord, I ask for your will to be done on this earth as it is in heaven, that I may rejoice with you, Father, in all things. And Jesus, I pray for the peace of my life. I take dominion and authority over every sickness, over every problem, over every mental stress in the name of Jesus, that you have set me free by your stripes, by your blood, by your sacrifice. And I claim it today in Jesus' name. Amen. And the Bible says that if we proclaim those things, that truly we are free, we are free indeed. John 1, 9 says that if we have confessed our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have confessed this morning and said, God, forgive us and set us free. And He has done that. Today, you have joy. Today, you have peace. Today, you have fulfilled the love in your heart. So I challenge you, share it with someone. Say, God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. God forgives you if you'll ask. He has forgiven me. God bless you. Hope to see you next week. Keep praying. Send us a a like or a testimony. And we thank God for all that he's already doing in your life. God bless you and see you next week.